Is this on? Yeah. Wow. Not quite sure how to begin. Um, that was so powerful, so emotional. Um, I think maybe give everybody just a few seconds. We don't have a whole lot of time just to get off of that, if you can. Um, Kunal, that is such a powerful story on so many different levels. Um, I have to start by asking, where did the idea come from? Okay. Um, yes, it is emotional. I was, I was actually standing at the back. I now know every dialogue. And when I hear a dialogue, I know so many minutes are left. Uh, I've seen the film many times. Yet when, um, when Miyagi finally comes, uh, you know, with a head shaven and, and wearing a white, it still brings a lump to my throat. I must have seen the film so many times now. Um, so kudos to, uh, to Aparna Shen. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a strange story, how I thought of this strange story. Uh, about two decades ago, um, perhaps even a bit more than two decades ago, when I lived in India, um, I was traveling to uh, a village with a friend of mine. I was a political activist then, from the left. Um, was not planning on writing a book or anything like that. And we were waiting at a ferry terminal in a village, and my friend pointed to a, a middle-aged gentleman and said, see him? He has a Japanese wife. Now, um, in an Indian metropolis, uh, it is not unusual to, have, to find people who have foreign spouses. But it's unusual in a, in a, in a village. And in a, even 20 odd years ago, it was very unusual. Um, I think I consider it my great good fortune that I did not ask my friend any follow-up questions. I didn't ask, for example, uh, how so? I mean, uh, has he ever been to Japan? Does he speak Japanese? Um, do they have kids? What languages do they speak? Um, I asked him no follow-up questions. But that single fact lodged in my mind, a villager in Bengal married to a Japanese woman. And about two decades later, an evening in Montreal, where I lived then, with a snowstorm raging outside my window, I wrote the story of the Japanese wife, uh, which again says how little I understand what happens inside my brain. Yeah. Now, if you wrote this while uh, sitting inside during a snowstorm in Montreal, you obviously had an incredible knowledge already about certainly the Sundarbans and Japan. Things like Miyagi, the meaning of the word, you know, the commonality between the toilets, which I think has been a huge bonding factor for many Indian and Japanese people, right. and right. other such things. Right. Um, let me start with Miyagi. Uh, we were doing the premiere of this film in Singapore uh, last year, and the Japanese ambassador to Singapore was in the audience. And he said, why did you, he was the first one to ask a question. He said, well, why did you choose a name called Miyagi? It's not a common name in Japan. I said, well, I wanted to have, create a bit of an old fashioned name. Because Snehomoy is an old-fashioned Bengali name. Like it's not a new contemporary name by any stretch of the imagination. But the real reason is, um, I'm a great fan of Japanese cinema. And one of my favorite directors is uh, Mijoguchi. And his film, Ugetsu Monogatari, is an all-time favorite of mine. And there's a character, the lead character, the woman in the film, is, was called Miyaga. And I had thought that if we had a daughter, I'm going to name her Miyagi. We actually did have a daughter. And in the excitement, we, I forgot. So I named her something else. Okay? So I had to use the name Miyagi somewhere. And it sort of seemed she was a gift to him. Uh, she was a gift to his life, in Snehoma's life. So I thought the name would be uh, appropriate as well. Um, sorry, your other question was? No, oh, I'm getting there to the other questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, Aside from the fact that you have crafted this wonderful story about an, an interracial marriage, effectively, um, it touches at something that is so much more basic, very basic, regardless of you know, whether the relationship is interracial or long distance or not. And that is that communication really is the key to a long, successful, and lasting relationship. Were you consciously thinking about this as you wrote it? Yeah. Um it, it, uh, just a quick uh, follow-up to the question that you earlier asked, Sh Sundarbans, okay? I left India when I was 21 years old, and I have never been to the Sundarbans. The first time I went to the Sundarbans was with the f director and, his f and her film crew, and they wanted to go into a recce in the Sundarban area, and they took me along, 
uh, to uh, see whether, and she said, well, we want you to show the, shoot, show the locations where we would shoot the film, and we want you to see the locations through the eyes of the writer to see if these locations sort of match what you had in mind. That was the first time I went to the Sundarbans, and the only time I have been there. Uh, certainly not before I had, I'd, I'd, I'd written The Japanese Wife. It is a very odd tale, and I, for the life of me, I don't know why I thought of it. Um, yes, communication is key. And it, to me, it is a story about intimacy. You know, on the one hand, you have Snehoma and Miyage, great intimacy through letters. So there's long distance nagging going on and everything that married couples do, you know. Uh, you know, you must boil the water, make sure you boil the water. You must make sure that you don't spend too much money, you know. Great intimacy, but no domesticity. And on the other hand, you have the widow with whom Snehomoy has great domesticity, everyday domesticity, but it's not really that kind of intimacy. So I was intrigued by this. In our lives, we oftentimes, or many of us oftentimes, have great intimacies with people with whom we don't share a domestic life. Okay. And there are others where you know, there's, again, a lot of domesticity. Not in the, and of course, communication is key, which is why the letters are so important. So what is it, Kunal, in your mind bec that makes sense, the intimacy versus the domesticity? Or can the, the two actually be married? Um, my wife is not in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Hence I ask. <laughs> I don't know. It works differently for different people. And for Snehoma, it certainly worked in a way, in a way which is extreme, which is surreal. When I narrated the story to Aparna Shen, and um, the film came about coincidentally, and I'll tell you a bit later if you, if you want to know, um, she said, this is a surreal story. Uh, it is completely improbable. And the reason I love the story is because it is surreal. And, um, and so, uh, you know, for, for different people, uh, there are people who watch the film and say, oh, this is rubbish. Why couldn't they just email? Why couldn't they just call? Um, I get this reaction quite a bit from um, in, in, in America, okay, in the US. We say, well, couldn't they have just picked up the phone and talked? <laughs> well, they could have, but uh, you know, it's a, only about 25% of India's population, even today, is on the information highway. As soon as you go to the Sundarbans, the first thing that struck me when I got on this boat on going for the recce is your mobile signal goes off. Okay? There's no mobile coverage in most parts. Okay? The electricity comes from solar power. It's very intermittent, very, very intermittent. Okay? Um, and there are many islands, there are 102 islands of the Sundarbans. Five of them are perennially submerged underwater. So this is a place which is a two-hour car ride away from Kolkata, a huge city, 16 million people. But as soon as you travel for those two hours and go to Sundarbans, you're not living on the information highway anymore. So how do people communicate? They write letters, and they receive letters. And when the barge comes in every morning to these islands with the letters, there are people who are waiting to receive their letters. Okay? So that is the, in the India that that I wanted to portray. So the Sundarbans, um, for those of you who don't know, is sort of the home, the mangroves of India and the home of the Bengal tiger. But uh, Kunal, speaking of stories, you have a fascinating story about how you actually talk to Aparna Sen about this story uh, to entice her into making it into a film in the first place. I didn't entice her, she enticed me. Okay. <laughs> uh, I knew her by reputation. I liked her cinema films, uh, 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 the films that she, she had directed. Prior to direction, she was, um, she was sort of this diva of Indian cinema, and she was an actress, much admired. Um, but I didn't know her. And she came on a social visit to Oxford, and we met uh, at a dinner party. And we started talking about travel and food and cinema and books and a whole host of things. And then she said, you know what? I, I want to make, uh, do a love story next. Except that love is so old-fashioned. I mean, everything has been done, you know, Romeo and Juliet and done to death. What's new about love? And I had a glass of wine in my hand, and I was feeling quite, you know, happy. And I didn't want to pitch a story to her. I had no, really had no interest. I said, but hang on. I think I have a love story which is different, which is unusual. She said, okay, tell me. And I think about 10 minutes or so, maybe even less than 10 minutes, I told her the gist of the story of the Japanese wife. 
And she said, have you sold it to anyone? I said, no. Don't sell it to anyone. I'm going to make a film out of this. And I thought, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, directors say these sorts of things. And I forgot about it. And th the following month, I was on a cruise in Alaska. When I get a phone message, the signals were still coming, a phone message from, from, the, from Aparna saying, you know, you actually have to sell me rights. Otherwise, the producer won't release funds. And I thought, well, now this is getting serious. Okay. And then we started talking about screenplays and things like that. And that's how it then suddenly took on a life of its own and came into being. Now, Aparna Sen actually did ask you to write the screenplay, did she not? Yeah. yeah. And why didn't you? Well, I declined for pretty much the same reason as Ian McEwan refused to write the screenplay for Atonement. And uh, the reason is, it's like this. I mean, you're a student, you write a paper for your teacher at school. And your teacher reads the paper and says, that's very good. And what, you, what I want you to do is go back and rewrite it, cut it by 50%, and then resubmit. But by then, your passion is gone because you've really done that first piece with a lot of passion. And I did not want to go, uh, because I'd invested so much passion with Snehumo and Miyagi, because they'd become so much a part of my inner life, I did not want to go back to that story and work on it again. Okay? But I did tell her that I will not sell you film rights till you show me the screenplay. And then we started this long distance communication. Uh, she would write bits of the screenplay she would send to me, and I would, 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 would comment, and I would say, no, this doesn't work, that works. It's her screenplay. But then we communicated a lot. And an interesting aside, do you see all these uh, letters when they wrote, dear S, dear M, dear S, dear M, right? Okay. So when Aparna would send me uh, her, uh, the parts of the screenplay, Sometimes, when the film directors are very busy people, she would send me something and she would do a text. Okay? I'm a professor. I don't do texts. <laughs> you know? My fingers don't move very fast on my Blackberry. Okay? And she would use all these acronyms and she says, K. And she would sign up saying R, which is sort of her nickname, Rina. And I got it, fell into the habit of saying, R, I think this is good, sign K. <laughs> then after a while, I, 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 when we spoke, I said, well, why don't you have them write to each other, dear S, dear M? Dear S, dear M. That's why it came out. Fascinating. Um, so did you have uh, some involvement in the other aspects of the production? The selection of the actors or anything else? Didn't you just love my cameo? I loved <laughs> your cameo. Uh, you didn't miss that. The person in the marketplace who Shenamoy runs into is yours. I didn't have a beard, so you may not have... Um, <laughs> I didn't really attend much of the shooting. Um, uh, I was in Australia at the time uh, on a literary fellowship uh, when she uh, started uh, filming in Japan and in, and in Kolkata. Uh, but on my way back, because my mum was then alive and lived in Kolkata, I would always stop and see my mum. And the shooting was going on, and she um, again would SMS me and saying, Snehomoy is dying. Do you not want to come? <laughs> You know, and it's very distracting. And so I would go and attend the shooting. And I must have gone for a grand total of three days or, or four days uh, to, to attend the shooting. Um, and in one of, um, one of those days, which was incredibly hot in Kolkata, and she said, now go get your makeup done. I said, what? Me? I said, yeah, go get your makeup done. We've got a role for you. <laughs> and so that's when I knew I'm going to be the angry pedestrian who dashes into Snehoma. Were you happy with the actors? Did you have any reservations about any of them at first? No, not really. Uh, let me tell you a bit about Snehomoy. So Rahul Bose, who you know well, uh, is a South Mumbai boy, which means he is hip. Okay? <laughs> His hair that stands out in real life. And, uh, but my Snehomoy doesn't have spiked hair, can't have spiked hair. He's a village school teacher. And I remember when I, uh, when I went to see the rehearsals before a day of shooting, it was a dark room, and they were rehearsing a, a, a scene. And as I walked in, and I saw Rahul um, practicing the role of Snehomoy. And I said, that's him. And to his credit, because he's such a good actor, the South Bombay boy turns into a Shundurban school teacher. And uh, I, mean, I was completely, um, you know, entranced by that. 
So before I turn it over to the audience for questions, because I know they've got plenty, I'd love you to tell us one more story. And that is the story of how you were born into this world of books, which is a fascinating little story in itself. Oh, gosh. <laughs> the birth. The birth. Yeah. Okay, here's a, here's a, sh here's a short version. My mom uh, was a very well-known writer of fiction in Bangla, which is my mother tongue. And my father was an independent publisher. So I grew up in a house full of books. The, we, are very book, we are a very bookish family. We are forever fighting and arguing over books and authors and saying, that's good, that's bad. In any case, my mom uh, was rushing to finish a manuscript for her publisher. And it was getting late, and she was writing. And I was supposed to be born. And she thought, well, I can just postpone this a little bit. Let me just finish this manuscript. In the morning, I'm going to go to the hospital. But I didn't want to wait that long. And so um, when she knew that she had to deliver me, uh, it was late, you know, uh, you couldn't call 911 or whatever you call to get, get, a, get an ambulance. What happened was they laid out um, a, a, a piece of cloth on the floor of our parents' library, surrounded by books. And she delivered me on the floor of the library, gawked at by an army of bemused authors. <laughs> okay? So I was born in a library. Quite a spectacle, huh? <laughs> All right, I know that uh, you all have a lot of questions, so I don't want to hold back. Um, let's have some questions from the audience. Yes, Tanya. Um, what you, next? What next? What books have you Well, uh, this year I have a new novel which has come out, which is The Yellow Emperor's Cure, it's a historical novel. I'm now working on a, a novel which is set, a contemporary novel which is set in Kolkata. It will be my first um, a novel which is a, not a historical novel. So it's a full-length novel, my fifth, uh, which is set in Kolkata, in the, in the, in the present time. So it's a contemporary novel. Are many of your novels set in Bengal? No, very, very few. Uh, my first novel, the, um, the Opium Clark, that I was reading from at Gullet House uh, a bit earlier, um, is in three parts, Calcutta, Canton, Kuching. And it's, it's set on the, so the trail of the opium trade. And it has uh, Calcutta, which was then Calcutta, not Kolkata, and, but only a third of the novel, and that to 19th century uh, Calcutta. Um, barring that, I haven't, uh, haven't really written uh, about uh, Kolkata or Bengal. My agent keeps asking me, when will you write your Bengal novel? And I keep saying, must I write a Bengal novel? <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Oh. Um, but as you were as you were writing the story, uh, um, you talked about the dualism of intimacy and domesticity. Was that something that you held in your head as you wrote the story, or did the story just unfold? No, it's a very good question. Um, rarely have I latched onto a concept, and I've said, "Let me exemplify the concept through a story." I don't think I've ever done that. Um, all of this is um, is uh, is hindsight is is afterthought. Okay, the written the story. I said, well, what does it mean? What does it mean to me? It may mean something else to you, the reader or the viewer. What does it mean to me? Uh, but this all afterthought. As I was writing the story, I was being carried away and floating along uh, these two lovers, and then you know the couple writing letters to each other, and then seeing where that story takes me. Um, in instinctively intuitively trying to feel my make feel my way through the story of their lives uh, never stopping to say it now now conceptually now, what should I be doing now and I always fear that if I do that then I would lose this the you know the string of the story uh, the whiff of the story is going to go away thank you so in other words, you don't pre-structure your stories. You let them unfold and let the meaning happen along no, the way. In a novel, you need a little bit of pre-thought. Uh, it's not that you sit down and start writing a novel, which is, for me, would take about two years to write and edit and write and edit and write and edit. Uh, so there is some degree of structure. Um, um, not a whole heck of a lot for me, because I want to feel that um, 
I can improvise and write and dream and change and fantasize and imagine as I'm, as I'm going along. If it is scripted and down, it, by the way, it works differently for different authors. I'm not implying that, pe uh, that authors who uh, use a lot of structure are inferior authors by no stretch of the imagination. Okay. But that's what it, how it works for me, that I have, uh, especially in the case of a novel, I can, s I can see the main thread of the novel, the spine of the novel, as it were, and then I write. The most important thing for me, different people have different strengths. For me, my most important thing is to be able to see, is image. If I'm able to see something or somebody in my mind's eye, I'm able to write. If I'm unable to see a scene, if I'm unable to see a person, I'm unable to write. Um, you know, I, I was very taken, I'm very taken by a, a line from Mozart who said, I saw the symphony in the flash of an eye. I didn't hear, I saw. Now how you see a symphony, I don't know, because I'm not a musician. But I have to see the novel in the flash of an eye. And then I start to write. Other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. How is the film received in India? Uh, surprisingly well. You know, when, uh, when Apurna thought of doing this film and she got into it, I said, are you sure? Are you sure you want to do this? This is a slow art film, sensibilities, nuances, turns of phrase. You know, India is, uh, has been spoiled, by, spoiled rotten by Bollywood. Uh, you know, in his speed, 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 you've got to cut and cut and cut and cut. Things should need to happen in the first five minutes, otherwise people walk out the door. Um, are you sure you want to do this? And she said, yes, I don't care how viewers would view it. I'm so gripped by it, I want to do this. Um, and in the, in the first few days of the, of the film, the way it happens in India is, uh, she and I went around many of this, uh, the theaters where it was playing, and chatted with the audience as they were leaving and talking. And I could see that she was incredibly nervous. She was incredibly nervous and she infected me. It's not my film, it's her film. Mm -hmm. It's my story, it's her film. And she infected me, we both were sitting at the back and saying, oh my God, they hate it. The audience must really hate it. You know, and maybe they're just gonna walk out. Maybe they're just being polite. They must really hate it. Um, the reason is, um, in contemporary Indian cinema, uh, this, is a language of Satyajit Ray. The, the language of this film is the language of classic, of Jean Renoir, of, of classic filmmaking. And I was unsure whether that would be appreciated. But how wrong I was, because there was, it, it played to packed houses. She, we still receive, she does, and I still receive emails, messages, a good two years after the release of the film, a good four years after the release of the book. So it must have struck a chord somewhere. I don't know why, but it has. And we had a question somewhere in the middle? Yes, same. How was it received was in it Japan? received in Japan? I didn't go for the premiere, uh, Aparna did. And apparently um, it, it got hugely positive reviews, which again surprised her. Um, and. Uh, very good turnout in, in the theaters. It won the Best Film Award at Calgary, I think you know that, uh, just a, a year or so ago. Uh, it did very well in Japan, did very well in the US um, and Canada. Um, uh, in the UK, did not have a commercial release, but it was released in art theaters, uh, did reasonably well there. Um, and once in a while when you're flying, if you switch on the channels, you will see the Japanese wife, which you can watch again on, so several airlines um, just around. Other questions, yes. Mm -hmm. um, no, actually, it's a good question. I, uh, when th this film was done, I had lost touch with this friend of mine, okay? This was years and years and years ago, and we were in university. I didn't know, you know, where his life had taken him, uh, and, I had shown up for a book reading in a bookshop in, in Kolkata, uh, one of many readings in a bookshop in Kolkata, and here is this chap, my friend. And uh, obviously he's great as I've grayed. I shouldn't say I've grayed, I've completely turned white, my, my hair. But he'd grayed, and we looked at each other, and he said, remember? I said, yeah, I do remember. And I said, but what happened to this man uh, who, with, with, the Jap with the Japanese wife? He said, he died. 
He said, well, just like that, he died. So yeah, he died. We all die, Kunal. And there was a question from the back. Arya. Um, what gave you the idea of them both um, falling sick? Sorry? What gave you the idea of them both falling sick? Sorry, both? Falling sick. Both falling sick. Good point. Um, it was, not, again, not, not a distinct idea, but um, I felt that um, we have a greatest concern for our loved ones when they are under some difficulty, particularly a health-related difficulty. That's where our deepest concern comes out. We free ourselves from everything else and say, how are you? How can I help you? What can I do to bring you back to health? And so for me, Snehoma's great concern for a, for a wife that he had never seen in his life uh, came because she fell ill. And then he does all these comical things, right? He goes and asks for a leave. Okay? And he goes around and talks to doctors everywhere you know, and uh, tries to uh, cure his wife long distance. Um, I must say that the thought of Snehomoy actually dying, not Miyagi, stricken with cancer, took me by surprise. And when I, when I was coming near to the, near the end of the story, can I read you the last bit of the story? The last yes, paragraph? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, does some, you have a book? I've got a book here. All right, he has, he has his own book. That's excellent. <laughs> Never leave home without the Japanese wife. Never leave home without the Japanese wife. That goes for all of you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I was actually... Um, Rolling along, uh, that uh, when um, he uh, peeled the edges and taking out the sheets, when he's holding uh, uh, his wi uh, the will that Miyagi had sent him, um, dear Snehumoy, he started to read. My dear, uh, my dear Snehumoy, she had written in crimson. When you set your eyes on this, I will be no more. Okay. And then comes this last paragraph, just the last paragraph of the story, which took me by surprise. The storm struck Shonai with a venom, erasing the boundary of tamarind and neem. As usual, it blew off the hay from peasants' huts and damaged the school building. Fortunately, the ferry had stopped plying and docked at a safe harbor. It returned in autumn when the river was full but calm. In the lull of winter, the only passage of significance was the untimely death of Snehumai Chakraborty, the mathematics teacher at the secondary school from the killer mosquitoes that spread a wider havoc than the river. I had him die by malaria. Besides friends and neighbors who knew him well, the whole village mourned his loss. The orphaned boy who had studied in the city but returned. The teacher who seldom erred before his students. Words weren't enough to console his poor aunt. At her request, the headmaster had written to Snehomar's wife, who lived far away, informing her of the terrible loss. And then... Then she came, head shaven, wearing the white of a Hindu widow. At Canning, she boarded the ferry, sitting upright, looking out towards the horizon. Her alien features drew attention. Reaching Shonai, she crossed the muddy path over the banks, called for a rickshaw, and asked to be taken to the house of the teacher, the one with the Japanese wife. Do we have time for a few more questions? Anybody else? Yes, in front. Um, I'm struck by how it really made me nervous. <laughs> in, in pretty much it. Hello? In pretty much everything he does. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah, uh, it is a good observation. I did not wa want to make him comical or bumbling, but I wanted him to be um, a simpleton. And I wanted to do that because I wanted to you, the reader, to see that inside was a very strong man. Inside was a person of immense conviction, caring, and steadfast in the notion, Miyagi is his wife, the wife he hasn't seen ever. Remember he says, in, when, he, when, he's, uh, when he writes to her, the, one of the last letters, and he says, without these letters, um, our, our, our marriage would mean nothing. Uh, as, your, as my wife, you'd, you, uh, I should tell you everything. You have a right to know everything. He's an incredibly strong man inside. Okay? 
but in his external um, ways, he, he's a bit, he's bumbl a bit bumbling, he's a bit of a simpleton, but he's not comical. Okay? At least I didn't want him to appear like that. But I wanted to draw, uh, draw attention to his inner strength. Other questions? Any other questions? Yes. Yes, Santo. Would he have written a last letter to his wife? Uh, the, he wouldn't be because he was very, very sick. I've never had malaria, but I think malaria is debilitating. Um, and of course, in, in, in the film, he doesn't die of malaria. He dies of pneumonia. Um, and um, I did want him, uh, the, the last letter I wanted, the very last letter I wanted, to, wanted him to write uh, was the one that is in the, in the book when he, when he says, well, um, you, you must respond to me. You must, even if you're angry with what I've done. All he's done is touch the face of the widow. Poor boy, poor man, you know. And he says, um, I must confess to you about, uh, about something. And, but please do re reply, because if you don't, I won't know whether you're alive. That's what he was trying to say. I, I have no way of knowing how are you, where are you, and if you're alive. Okay. That's the last letter I wanted him to write. One last question. Yes. Sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Um, did you ever consider writing an alternative ending where they actually meet at the end? No, absolutely <laughs> not. Okay. The best love in this world is unrequited love. Okay. Everything else pales in comparison. Alas, yeah. sad note to end the afternoon with. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Dr. Kunal Basu, who in his other life is a professor at Oxford, uh, teaching business. Yeah, unfortunately. Unfortunately, teaching business. Um, not the business you should be learning, but you know, the writing. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, for those of you who are interested in listening to more of his fascinating insights uh, about his life as a writer, another reading, and some great anecdotes about Kolkata, Calcutta. Um, he'll be featured on an upcoming episode of Asian Threads on RTHK Radio 3, so listen on a coming Sunday. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.